1789, after the ratification of the United States Constitution, a new US federal government was established. No more British colonialism, they're now America. The only problem was the cost of the Revolutionary War left them with a debt of $54 million, and the state governments also amassed an additional $25 in debt, million, that is. Here we have Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton. Actually, it's not that bad at all. I can use this debt to create a financial system that would possibly promote American prosperity. In the report on public credit, Hamilton urges Congress to combine the state and national debts into one, which would be funded by the federal government. Congress approved this initiative in June of 1790 and put it into action in July of that same year. Imports were the primary source of revenue for the government at that time, and taxes were an extremely popular thing among the bulk of the population. The government needed to pay their debt, so Hamilton promoted the first tax levied by the national government on various domestically produced distilled spirits, or fun juices, which became widely known as the whiskey tax. The western part of Pennsylvania at this time was separated from the east by the Allegheny Mountains. The population there was 17,000 people, and the majority of them were farmers. There was a limited market for the sale of their grain locally, and it was difficult to transport the grains to the east for sale. It is so unfair to target Westerners like us. Ah, <sighs> right. <gasps> Wait, I have an idea. Let's turn our grain into whiskey. Isn't it gonna be easier this way? That's a really nice one. Yes, we will be less competitive with Eastern grain producers. Perhaps. Previously, under the Articles of Confederation, a central government could not levy taxes. Cash was always in short supply on their frontier, so whiskey served as a medium of exchange. This whiskey excise is relatively luxury, so it would be the least objectable tax the government can levy. Aha! I'm so smart. Wait a second. We were used to stealing our surplus from minted grain to make whiskey tax-free. And why do we have to pay tax for wine now? It just doesn't make any sense. Um... Hopefully a sin tax like this would help you raise public awareness about the harmful effects of alcohol. I don't care. You have to know that we're mad that the transportation tax has increased, causing us to lose profit off of what people like me sell. <sighs> Meanwhile, President George Washington is not happy with Hamilton and his promotion of the whiskey tax, so Washington travels to the Virginia Peninsula to meet with local governments. To his surprise, the views on the whiskey tax were relatively enthusiastic, and so George Washington took those views to Congress and then passed the bill for the whiskey tax. The whiskey tax became law in March of 1791, putting an excise tax on all distilled spirits. The unusual thing is that they were required to be paid in cash. Hold on, what do you mean? We have always used whiskey to pay for all goods and services. And now all of a sudden, you want us to pay this new tax in cash? Guys, we need to support the excise tax. It does give us advantages. Hmm, <clears throat> is it just us? Or do they also have the same benefits? Uh, let me go ask. Hi, right, Small. How much tax do you have to pay per gallon? Like 9 cents. Can you believe that? What about you? Oh, just as low as six cents, according to Hamilton. What? Are you kidding me? The tax for the smaller producers was required to be made throughout the year, while the large producers in the East took less exception to the tax. Their cost to get the goods to market was less, and they could decrease their tax by increasing their volume, something the farmers in the West weren't really able to do. Let me ask you one more thing. Did you design this tax to ruin us? Hmm? The law required all stills to be registered, and those who failed to pay the tax had to appear in federal court. Tax rebels harassed several whiskey tax collectors and threatened or beat those who offered them office space or housing. Many small western distillers simply refused to pay the tax. As a result, many western counties never had a resident federal tax official. 
The U.S. just lost a big battle in the Northwestern Indian War, and they aren't quite protecting those people who live in the Western Frontier. What do you think we should do? We need to have a plan of self-protection. Let's go ahead and prohibit them from using the Mississippi River for commercial navigation. In addition to the whiskey tax, Westerners had many other complaints about the government. Spain, which then owned Louisiana, gradually claimed more land beyond the boundaries of Florida to gain an issue for negotiation. For this reason, Westerners felt that the government was ignoring their security and economic welfare. Adding the whiskey excise to these existing grievances increased tensions on the frontier even more. Guys, I know we need to pay debt, but look at our people. Many of the Western frontier are petitioning against the passage of whiskey excise, and I hope we won't have any outbreak of violence. As mediator in 1794 during the Whiskey Rebellion, he lost favor with both sides, but wrote incidents of the insurrection in the western parts of Pennsylvania in the year 1794. The convention sent a petition to readdress grievances to the Pennsylvania Assembly and the U.S. House of Representatives. Other than Brackenridge, Finley and Gallatin also attempted to mediate between the rebels and the government in Philadelphia. As a result of this and other petitions, the excise law was modified in May of 1792. What kind of change is it? It's only a cent reduction in tax. What do you want us to do with this one cent that doesn't help anything? Yes, the new excise law was still unsatisfactory to many Westerners, so appeals to nonviolent resistance were pretty unsuccessful. Supporters argued that there was a difference between taxation without representation in colonial America and the tax laid by the elected representatives of the American people. However, because of these and other nonviolent attacks, or other violent attacks, my bad, the tax went uncollected throughout the frontier state of Kentucky in 1791 and early 1792. I am advocating for military action to suppress the violent resistance in the western North Carolina. Hamilton, I'm sorry, but there was an insufficient evidence to legally justify such a reaction like this. In August 1792, a militant group known as the Mingo Creek Association created an extraragal court and discouraged lawsuits for debt collection and foreclosures. Oh no, this is such a serious threat to the operation of laws at the federal government. Washington and Hamilton felt particularly embarrassed about their resistance to federal law in Pennsylvania because their national capital was in the same state. On his own initiative, Hamilton drafted a presidential proclamation condemning opposition to the excised laws. Washington signed the proclamation on September 15, 1792, published as a broadsheet and reprinted in many newspapers. From this point, tax collectors were not only people targeted in Pennsylvania, but also those who cooperated with federal tax officials also faced harassment. Resistance to the excise tax continued through 1793 until worry over rising mob groups in Pennsylvania sparked presidential action. Guys, accept this peace treaty. No, we're gonna attack Pennsylvania. I'm sending my militia, so don't you dare. Uh-oh. Washington's large, well-armed militia arrived in Pennsylvania and were met with little resistance. By the time they arrived, many of the mob participants had fled and ran away. The group was then marched to stand trial, with only two of them found guilty. So basically, my plan worked? No, Hamilton. It didn't work. But if anything, it demonstrated federal power and the growing necessity for a new constitution and the necessity to protect the right to protest in said constitution.